1066, the most famous date in British history. William the Conqueror from Normandy defeated the Saxon Harold at the Battle of Hastings to become King of England. William and a handful of barons then imposed one of the most brutal governments this country has ever seen, reducing many to a life littered than slavery. William built this fort in the centre of Old Sarum near Salisbury in 1070, one of a network that covered the land. William had to make his relatively small 10,000 strong force a visible and intimidating presence. The layout of the fort at Old Sarum shows what a precarious hold the Normans had on the country. I'm standing on the Norman defences, but these have been built within a much bigger, older fort. Huge Iron Age and Saxon forts could be a refuge for whole communities. The smaller Norman forts simply protected the elite and symbolised the power of the occupying army. From them, William imposed a system of government that became known as feudalism. It defined the way the whole country from loftiest lord to lowliest peasant lived. This is the story of life in feudal Britain, how it posed in 1066, how people fought it to try and maintain a vestige of dignity, and how eventually the events of the Black Death devastated the land and the feudal system itself. This is the fifth age of Britain. The Normans were in no way culturally superior to the people they'd conquered. Saxon England had fine centres of learning. Its art and literature were famous across Europe. The country was well run. Central government, particularly by the standards of the day, was pretty accountable. The king didn't automatically inherit his crown. He had to be elected by a council of nobles and clemen. And there was local government. The country was divided into hundreds, roughly the area that supported a hundred households, and each had its own court, where justice was meted out by local men and the king's representative. Partly because English government was so well dug in, William had to impose his rule with shock and awe. The Tower of London is the most famous of a thousand castles William built at strategic points throughout the land, deliberately designed to subdue local communities. This was a mania for building massive stone structures, not seen since the Romans had left six centuries earlier. In Norwich, the town's 10,000 Anglo-Scandinavian inhabitants, descendants of Saxon and Viking invaders from previous centuries, saw a huge castle being built on a hill in the middle of town, just one year after the conquest. This is the obvious place to build a castle, but we know there were 98 Anglo-Scandinavian houses in this area. This was a minor inconvenience for the Normans, and they levelled every home. Throughout England, the Normans destroyed houses to make way for their castles. In York, a whole district was demolished. In Lincoln, 160 houses were levelled. In Shrewsbury, 51. Building castles didn't just destroy homes. In the 1970s, Archaeologist Brian Ayres was excavating this area to the northeast of the castle, now under the Anglia TV building. He found the Normans levelled a wooden church here, one used by the poorer citizens of Norwich. It had been quite deliberately destroyed to make way for the northeast enclosure of the castle, and um, part of the graveyard itself had been rooted up, dug up, so that they could um, steepen the slope in order to stiffen the defences of the castle. Now, within that redeposited earth was a lot of disarticulated bone. 
there were adults and children, presumably the lately dead, presumably some people in an advanced state of putrefaction, presumably people that the local people knew. And these were being rooted out of the ground by these alien invaders and dumped to create this defensive work. It must have been an absolutely appalling situation. The castle was begun in 1067, one year after the conquest. The grand stone keep was finished 50 years later. Its size would have seemed all the more imposing when most of the town's inhabitants lived in single-room huts. The majority of people are going to be living in timber houses with lath and plaster, and many of them are actually going to be in clay-walled buildings, single-storey clay-walled buildings, possibly not even heated buildings. Um, pretty grim stuff sometimes. The contrast with the castle and its grand staterooms couldn't be more obvious. It is the symbol of the king, the crown, within Norwich. It's, it's a way of demonstrating to the people of Norwich and Norfolk that the establishment has changed, that there is a new regime and it's here to stay. The Normans saw towns as a useful way to dominate a whole region, both politically and economically. They built new ones, like Bridge North, Ludlow and Newcastle. In places like Norwich, they created Francophile districts and populated them with French traders and businessmen. They also centralise economic power into their own hands. And one of the ways of doing that is to create an entire borough for the Frankie de Norwick, the Frenchman of Norwich, which is laid out to the west of the castle, around a brand new marketplace for the establishment of a Norman town with Norman burgesses controlling commerce. The Norman market is still at the heart of Norwich today. When it was built, just after 1066, it was an instrument of oppression. Part of a deliberate policy to ruin the Anglo-Scandinavian population who had had a market of their own in another part of town. With the town's new Norman elite spending their money here, the Anglo-Scandinavian market couldn't compete and has long disappeared. Norwich is typical of towns across England. Within a decade of the conquest, the Normans held political power. They held commercial power. The final piece in the jigsaw was spiritual power. Anglo-Saxon England had been more or less Christian since the seventh century. William knew controlling the church was a crucial step to controlling the people of England. He and later his son, William Rufus, systematically replaced high-ranking Anglo-Saxon clergymen with Normans. In Norwich, the Norman abbot was called Lozinga. In 1096, he started building the massive cathedral that stands to this very day. Like other Norman cathedrals, it was intended to dwarf all the nearby Saxon churches. I mean, it is huge. <laughs> there is nothing like this in Norwich before they arrive, and so it has to have this massive statement of intent. You have to try and imagine this place when it was newly built. Not only was it a monstrous structure, but it would have been whitewashed from the ground to the spire, and would have gleamed out as a physical manifestation of political power. But there was something more intimate and subtle going on here, too. In the medieval mind, your relationship with the spiritual world was of tantamount importance. And now the Normans controlled not only your land, but access to your god. This is a new order that's in, in charge of your religion as well as in control of the political situation in the country. And so the sorts of small, perhaps more personal churches that a lot of the Anglo-Scandinavian population would have known has been totally dominated by this. A whacking great stone building plonked down right next to their big marketplace. The problem for the Norman abbot Lozinga was why should the Anglo-Scandinavian community come to his great new church when they already had a perfectly good one of their own nearby? 
and it was rather inconvenient to have that sitting right next to your new cathedral. So what seems to have happened is that it was removed, expunged if you like, from the uh, new Norman landscape of Norwich and removed about a quarter of a mile across the river that divides the town centre from uh, the outskirts of Norwich. Within a few decades, with a new cathedral and castle, the Normans had reshaped Norwich and many English towns in their image. So complete was this foreign takeover that William of Malmesbury, writing in about 1125, said, England has become a residence for foreigners and the property of aliens. At the present time, there is no English earl, nor bishop, nor abbot. Strangers all, they prey upon the riches and vitals of England. In the countryside, where 90% of the population lived, not a soul would be free from the vice-like grip of Norman rule. When William the Conqueror became king, the 4,000 Anglo-Saxon earls, who had owned all of England, were driven off their lands. William made it clear that he now personally owned the entire country. He then appointed about 200 Norman barons as his tenants in chief. He permitted the barons to hold large swathes of the country as long as they continued to provide him with soldiers. The barons often sublet parts of their territories to lesser nobles and knights, also in return for military service. This system, known later as feudalism, was the key to the Normans' success. It meant the king had a ready supply of soldiers with whom he could dominate his Anglo-Saxon subjects and defend his new kingdom from other wannabe conquerors. In 1085, the Danes threatened to invade, and William decided he needed an audit of the whole country so he could extract the maximum number of soldiers from his barons. He commissioned a massive survey, so detailed that the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle said that not even an ox, nor a cow, nor a swine was there left that was not set down in his writ. For the English, the investigation was so invasive and all-seeing, it felt as though Judgment Day had come. And so they called William's document the Doomsday Book. The Doomsday Book, all 400 double-sided pages of it, is one of the greatest documents in English history. It records in extraordinary detail how the Normans organised their new kingdom. The Normans held on to the Saxon hundreds, but they carved up the land into what they called manors, each with its own Norman lord. On these, there were three distinct grades of unfree peasants, people who lived by a rigid pecking order. The Doomsday Book entry for the Hampshire village of Lasham lists the grades of unfree peasant who lived there. Villains have a few more privileges than Bordars, but still both of them have to work the Lord's land in return for a small amount to farm for themselves. Here in Lasham, we know that in domain is one plough, so the Lord has an area of land called a plough. There are eight villains and seven Bordars with four ploughs. And then we come across the people who really are right at the bottom of the pile. Five slaves. Men and women who have neither lands nor rights and who the Lord can buy and sell at will. Slave or unfree, the Lord controlled even the most intimate details of his peasants' lives. Their property belonged to the Lord, the money belonged to the Lord, their marriages were controlled by the Lord, and of course they had to do labour services on the Lord's land and they had to pay quite heavy rents to the Lord. These were hard times. The average life expectancy was 25. This is the graveyard of the deserted village of Warren Percy in North Yorkshire. In the shadow of the roofless church, there's poignant evidence of the odds people were up against. <laughs> 
under our feet are the graves of thousands of villagers. And the, when you analyse the bones carefully, you can see evidence of interruptions to growth which are caused by um, major diseases or major episodes of hunger which actually affected the growth of the bone. And there's certainly evidence there of a great deal of um, infection, of ill health in the population. And on top of that, high-level politics often had lethal consequences. The peasant was expected to help his lord fulfill his obligations to the king. This arrowhead that was found here hasn't been used for hunting. It's made for military combat. That long, thin shape is designed to penetrate chainmail. As the kings of England fought Wales and Scotland and then France, they needed their nobles to generate large armies of foot soldiers. And Warren Purse is exactly the kind of place that found its young men heading off for war. The century following the Norman Conquest must count as one of the worst in our history. William the Conqueror's descendants fought vicious civil wars over England and reduced the country to a desperate state of anarchy. This is one monk's description of the England of 1137. Wretched men starved of hunger. Every man robbed another. The land was all laid waste by such deeds. And they said openly that Christ and his saints slept. But from this low point, somehow people began to improve their lot. During the second half of the 12th century, while England's kings were distracted by foreign wars and crusades, at home, milder weather and improved tools helped the peasants open up new land for plough and for pasture. Suddenly, there was more food to go around. In Warren Percy, there's evidence of an improved standard of living for many of the villagers. This depression in the soil, partly the result of years of sweeping by a medieval housewife, is all that remains of a peasant house. This is the doorway in the wall of this peasant house and now we're coming into a division between two rooms. There's, a, there's an inner um, uh, partition there. So if we come up here, we'll be coming through another door in the partition and now we're in what must be the living room, what people would sometimes call the chamber. Uh, and this is the, and, and you can see the outline of the walls around us. It's about, it's about 30 feet long, it's about 15 feet wide. And how many people living in a space like this? Well, usually about five. I mean, it's a nuclear family, just like the ones that we have, really. And animals kept in a place like this? Sometimes you find there are animals kept at one end. Feudal customs still dictated that the majority of the food the peasants grew and the animals they tended were consumed by the lord of the manor and his household. Uh, let me give you a gobstick. <laughs> Thank you. The peasants <laughs> ate the leftovers. And then a family then shared a communal bowl of vegetable and stew and called pottage. Mm, exactly that sort of thing I eat the whole time. <laughs> anyway, because <laughs> I'm vegetarian. Oh, very good. There were no forests around Warren Percy. What wood there was, was used to heat the manor house. The peasants mainly used cow dung. When dry, it burns much like peat. Of course, in winter time, it didn't dry very well. Uh, so what you did as a housewife uh, was collect it uh, in its semi-liquid state, bring it back to the farmhouse, and there uh, mix it with chopped straw, I don't know what the equivalent word is for snowballs, but you made those and flung them on the wall of the house uh, where there was a decent light or a chimney behind it. When they fell off, they were ready. <laughs> Fantastic. So they're, they're stored on the wall until they dry? Yes. Great. Yes. Even in the poorest households, where everyone lived and ate cheek by jowl, Manners and etiquette were rigorously observed. Food had to be cut, held and eaten in only one way. So what you do is you hold your piece of cheese in your thumb and first two fingers of your left hand. Yeah. 
and you hold your piece of bread in the other two fingers. Yeah. And that means when you eat, you take a bit of bread, then a bit of cheese. Aha. Uh -huh. You that way. If I were to eat this like you might eat a modern dinner bun, let's say, like biting it, that shows I've got absolutely no manners at all. Only animals bite, and you're human. And that goes right the way through all those society. Peasants clung on to a degree of dignity and were constantly trying to escape the more pernicious aspects of feudalism. For instance, everyone was supposed to grind their corn at the Lord's Mill and pay him a fee for the privilege. But many Warren Percy houses had their own grinding stones, proof that people ignored this blatantly unfair regulation. Yeah, well, they started building it. Peasants in England were standing up for themselves. They were the first in the world to realize that the law, invented to protect the rich, could also defend the poor. And you're the keeper of the key, clearly. That's right, yes. Manorial courts, which had been introduced to enforce feudal regulations, became venues to challenge them. One court, now albeit with very limited powers, still sits here in Danby Castle in North Yorkshire. Back in medieval times, legally savvy peasants would even club together to hire a lawyer to challenge their lord if, for example, he fined them unfairly. By the early 1200s, Peasants were finding ways to deal with social inequality and the hardships of life. Courts were important, but the village church gave people their constant moral anchor. Everyone, rich and poor, was baptised and married in church. They attended mass every Sunday of their lives, and when they died, they were buried on church ground. The church puts itself forward as offering a spiritual welfare state. It says, we will offer you eternal life through our structures of the church, through the sacraments and through our teaching. And if you keep within the bounds that we are laying down to you, um, you know, basically you, you will get to heaven. Here in the village of Peakirk in Northamptonshire, hidden under whitewash for centuries, is a faint reminder of how the church taught people what was right and wrong. Paintings like these would have festooned church walls up and down the land. Their earthy colours have faded, but the simple morality tales they told can still be deciphered. You get figures such as the young men who swear too much and who gamble too much. You get the, the fraudulent alewife who's selling people short and who's tarting herself up to get all the men into her inn. A common theme in church paintings was to warn people how evil and dangerous gossip was, particularly in the small, closely knit medieval village. These two women are clearly deep in conversation. Jangling is how medieval contemporaries would have described it. The woman on the right's got her hands thrust into her pockets and the lady on the left is gesticulating to dramatise her story. Standing on their shoulders, there's a little demon. Emphasis that this is the devil's work. It wasn't that sharing information per se was a problem, but what the authorities didn't like the idea of was that women were using a trip to church as an excuse to huddle together and swap ideas, or even worse, gossip about their men. Theoretically, a medieval church answered to the Pope in Rome. In practice, in rural England, it was run by and for the community. The church is the main building. If you wanted to meet somebody in a village, you'd say, oh, we'll see you in the church. They've come to hear some news, they've come to pick up a job, they've come to exchange money, they've come to discuss something in business. They're not here just um, out of, a, sort of some religious motivation. It is the focus of their communal lives. And it shows that people can organise themselves 
in a very adverse situation with a lord who's making constant demands on you. And yet they win through, really. They establish themselves, they establish their families, uh, they establish a community which is capable of building a, a church and so on. Uh, so one, one can only admire their, their fortitude. This fortitude did pay off. Autocratic systems tend not to survive. And by the beginning of the 13th century, the harsh distinction between Norman overlord and Saxon subject was beginning to blur. Also, more importantly, by 1214, William's great-great-grandson, King John, had lost all his French territories. Now the king and the aristocracy were forced to regard England as their home. The futile battles to hold on to France had cost the barons dear, and now they were in bullish mood. They demanded new lands, new rights, and new checks on the king's power. Here at Runnymede, they forced King John to sign the Magna Carta. The feudal system had been pierced at its very heart. And without expensive overseas lands to protect, the country could concentrate on making money while keeping God on side. By the late 1100s, the English economy was growing rapidly. The nobility began to take an interest in agriculture rather than just warfare. And as a result, managed their property more productively, creating a surplus of some commodities like wool. Markets and fairs did brisk business. The towns the Normans had established around their castles boomed. Norwich, which in 1066 had felt the full brunt of the Norman jackboot, was now benefiting from strong trade links to France and Flanders. The city was already the regional capital. It was developing very fast indeed. There were between 25 and 40 churches in 1066. By the middle of the 13th century, we had 60 parish churches. A very diverse economy, over 120 different trades and, and, and industries. Um, and um, a, a, a commercial trade which was not only coastal and national but even international. The Norman church also changed. Originally set up to control the spiritual life of a conquered people, it now began to provide social services especially for the poor in the towns. This is St Cross Hospital in Winchester. It was founded in 1132. It provided shelter for the sick and gave alms to the poor. Even today, if you turn up and ask for the dole, you're given a cup of ale and a small piece of bread. But the established church wasn't the only religious force in the country. One of the consequences of the Norman conquest was greatly increased links with Europe. And as a result of that, the many monastic and mendicant orders that had been founded there since the 7th century took the opportunity to set up and recruit in England. When William the Conqueror arrived in 1066, there were about 50 religious houses in England. Within 200 years, that figure was closer to 900. And by the end of the 13th century, there were nearly 18,000 men and women who'd become either monks or friars or nuns. This was an age of acute religious conviction and spiritual anxiety. Death came early and hellfire was preached from church pulpits. By joining a religious order, people thought that they were pleasing God and increasing their chances of eternal salvation. The chief benefit of this to the nation was that the monastic orders showed an extraordinary aptitude not just for charity, but for trade and industry. Monasteries had two great advantages. They were the only organisations in the country that had no feudal obligations, and they were hardwired into a vibrant Europe-wide community. 
They could own land, but they didn't have to provide the king with soldiers and money. Instead, they could turn their energies to enterprise. The story of one order, the Cistercians, typifies how monks started off living in self-denial and hardship and ended up being the wealthiest and most powerful industrialists in the country. This is the spectacular Fountains Abbey in North Yorkshire. In 1132, when a group of 50 or so Cistercians arrived from France, there was nothing here but bog and forest. At first, the Cistercians built a few wooden huts, the minimum shelter needed to live and pray. The name Cistercian comes from the Latin cisterna, a marsh, exactly the kind of hostile environment that these communities sought out. And when they arrived in this country, word spread quickly that these were hard-line ascetics. They ate only meagre rations and were committed to getting their hands dirty through manual labour. Their rough habits were made of untreated wool, bad at the best of times, but these men weren't allowed to wear any kind of undergarment, not even to keep out the chill of a Yorkshire winter. And if a monk ever strayed from the path of righteousness, one punishment was to wear a shirt made of rough goat's hair under his habit. This is a fairly common way of making your life as unpleasant as possible whilst giving no external appearance of it, because of course you can't see the hair shirt, but it, it it's, um, itches and scratches and makes your skin really quite unpleasant after a while, and particularly if the shirt's been on for a few weeks. It's a method of self-mortification. Ironically, their reputation as the holiest of monks began the Cistercian transformation from ascetics to tycoons. It worked like this. The wealthy gave land to the monastery, and in return the monks prayed for their souls to go to heaven. Bit by bit, much of the Yorkshire Dales ended up in Cistercian hands. It was largely marshy and of poor quality. The monks believed it was their duty to improve it. But it was a gargantuan task. So monasteries like Fountains recruited so-called lay brothers from the local peasantry to provide labour. The lay brothers worked as builders, carpenters and cooks, and above all, farmed the monastery's growing estates. They identified that there were lots of people who couldn't become monks. They were peasants, they were illiterate, no other order would take them. The Cistercians saw that they could actually run their land with their own army of lay brothers in a way where, where they had total control. The lay brothers had to take religious vows but could never become monks themselves. For those who couldn't cope with the restrictions of the feudal village, life in a monastery was an appealing alternative. You were guaranteed food and shelter. Over 300 lay brothers slept in a dormitory in this building. The offer had to be a good one. It was an organised, secure life. You were fed regularly. Because you're working for a growing corporation, there is no problem in years of famine. It also gave them eternal salvation because they would benefit from the fundamentalist religious beliefs of the monks themselves. Could they bring their, their families with them, the lay brothers? No. Uh, the Cistercians, from the earliest years, were terrified of women. Um, a lay brother could leave his wife and children and join the abbey, and live a celibate life, but he had to adopt the same principles as monks, uh, poverty, chastity and obedience, and particularly obedience. What happened to the women and children? Yeah, they were abandoned. By the early 1200s, monasteries like Fountains were all-male, two-tier societies. Highly educated monks served by lay brothers who labored for God rather than a salary. This setup was conducive to commerce. The lay brothers drained the dales and started huge sheep farms. Their superiors were among the few in medieval society who were literate and numerate. They did the books. 
Soon, the monks were producing far more wool than they needed for their habits. Fountains and abbeys like it are working on an industrial scale. You have the economies of scale. Your, um, your production costs are lower. You're not paying anybody. You're simply feeding lay brothers. Um, uh, your goods are cheaper in the market, so therefore you sell more of them. In its heyday, Fountains was earning profits of around a million pounds a year in today's money. A large part of the monastery grounds resembled an industrial site rather than a centre of holiness. Here there were smithies, bakeries and breweries. This enormous structure was where raw wool from the sheep farms came to be processed. This was where the Abbey's wool crop was brought in every year to be sorted, to be stored, to be bagged. When it was built back in the 1150s, this was one of the biggest buildings inside the monastery. Just look at the size of that blocked up door in the south wall there, big enough to get wagons in. We have over in the far corner there tanks for cleaning the wool. We have a couple of furnaces in the middle here for boiling up water as part of the cleaning operation. At the end of the building here, we have the, uh, the office that the monk worked from. And the room we're in now is where people who were transporting the wool would have to come through here. This is a sort of checker where the wool was counted in, counted out. And eventually sent off, first of all by road and then by river, to the continental wool merchants. The problem was, the Cistercians needed large waterways to carry boats laden with wool to ports, which in turn were connected to the great commercial centres of Europe. In the late 12th century, neither facility existed in Yorkshire. Then came a fortuitous bequest from a wealthy nobleman, a large tract of land on the north bank of the Humber River. It was actually a pretty mean-spirited gift. This whole area was salt marsh and virtually impossible to cultivate. Mind you, not that that deterred a driven phalanx of men like the Cistercians. From 1190, they combined visionary fervour with an acute business sense and masterminded a massive civil engineering project. To realise it, they relied on the collective muscle of thousands of lay brothers. They drained the marsh and channeled the streams into a new man-made river. The waterway was big enough and deep enough to accommodate ocean-going trading vessels. God's wilderness had been transformed into an international port. We now know it as the town of Hull. The wool from a million and a half sheep went through Hull every year to clothe rich and poor throughout Europe. Soon, other products followed. A merchant from Bruges in the 1250s noted that from England come wool, hides, lead, tin, coal and cheese. The Cistercian investment in Hull paid off big time. They charged duties on everything that went in and out of the port. And by 1300, a group of men who'd taken a vow of poverty were among the wealthiest in the country. The Cistercian's success story was a sign of the times. By the beginning of the 14th century, we were already well on our way to becoming a nation of shopkeepers. Since 1066, the population had more than doubled and was now well over four million. And much of the prosperity that allowed for that came from international trade. But as well as trade, a disaster was heading towards us across the channel arguably the worst that the country has ever experienced. By the late 1200s, life had changed for many. Britain was emerging as a vibrant trading nation. 500 new towns had appeared since the Norman Conquest in 1066, the population rose to around four million. But no society is immune to natural disaster. First, deluge-like rainfall destroyed harvests, causing widespread famine in 1315 and 16. There were even stories 
of hunger driving some to cannibalism. But this was nothing compared to what followed. A disaster so extreme, it would sound the death knell of feudalism and the stranglehold of the established church. As we reeled from the effects of famine and the subsequent recession, we were hit by the most calamitous event in our long history. Here in the summer of 1348 at Malcolm Regis and at ports all the way along the south coast, black rats carrying the bubonic plague jumped off ships and started a pandemic of a scale not seen before or since. The Black Death had arrived and within three years it would wipe out half of the population. This is Winchester Cathedral. The records of its chief cleric, Bishop Eddington, bear witness to the terrifying onset of the Black Death. In October 1348, he wrote, We report with anguish the serious news which has come to our ears, that this cruel plague has now begun a savage attack on the coastal areas of England. We are struck by terror, lest this brutal disease should rage in any part of our city or diocese. May God avert it. But God ignored the plea. Few passers-by realise that the horror of the Black Death is set in the very stone of Winchester Cathedral. Just before the apocalypse struck, the building was undergoing an expensive facelift. And just about 1347, they started on the new doorway at the bottom in the expensive decorated architecture style of the mid 14th century. And then something happened. Probably for a whole generation, there was no more work on the cathedral. Now I think that what happened was the Black Death came along and it killed the masons, it killed the demolition men, and it stopped the work on the cathedral. Compared to the ornate decorations in the cathedral entrance, the upper level, built after the Black Death, is plain. Signs of a shortage of craftsmen and the use of mass-produced components. As the plague swept through the country in 1348, chronicles describe classic symptoms of the disease. Vicious attacks of sneezing and coughing, swellings the size of apples in the armpit and groin, with death following in four or five days. The response of the townspeople of Winchester, and indeed of the whole country, was to turn to the church, the institution that was supposed to guide people through calamity. They thought it came from God on the whole, and the authorities reacted appropriately. They told people to say prayers, they told them to say penitential psalms, they told them to process through the cities with bare feet and heads bowed, and here in Winchester they were told to say 22 psalms on Wednesdays and Saturdays and on Fridays they had to come out of the cathedral here and meet with the townspeople and process around the town uh, up here past us and then back into the cathedral and have their service. You dealt with it as a manifestation of um, the displeasure of God. As the death toll mounted it became obvious the prayers weren't working. It also became obvious that the wealthy and pious, people who were supposed to be close to God, weren't spared either. One of the king's daughters died, the Archbishop of Canterbury died, the prior of the abbey here in Winchester died, the abbess of the nunnery, the abbess down the road in Rumsey. At the highest level of society, people died. So God's at least as cross with the clergy as he is with the laity. Seeing God angry with the clergy profoundly undermined their authority. It was a significant moment. During the Black Death, for the first time, people dared to question the powers that be, both religious and secular. Feudalism was starting to lose its grip. In Winchester, trouble began when a priest was seen burying people in a cemetery in the middle of town, not in a plague pit outside. 
and he's standing there in his monk's habit with his tonsured head and the townspeople come running in from over there climb over the wall and this is all recorded in the bishop's register and the bishop says in spite of him being plainly visible as a monk by his tonsure and clothing they attack him what's significant is not why the priest was attacked but that people dared to attack such a venerated figure at all when clergymen carried on burying the dead in the middle of town it sparked a full-scale riot in the summer of 1349. The townspeople came brandishing sticks and staves and saying they would burn the monastery to the ground if the burials went on in the middle of town. All over the country, there were reports of attacks on the clergy. The psychological shift towards anger and resentment was accompanied by physical changes in the landscape. It became bleak and empty, inhabited only by the remnants of a population who, it was said, had become wild and miserable. This was once the village of Idsworth. Here, between 1349 and 50, half the population died. Before the Black Death, 650 years ago, there was a village here around the church. And if you walk in the fields between here and the church, you pick up the remains of what the people who lived there left behind them, the pottery from the Middle Ages scattered over the field. And that reminds us of that community that's gone, where there were once families and children calling out, and now it's silent, and just the church up there on the top of the hill. Villages did struggle on after the Black Death. But for many, their viability as communities was undermined. And across the nation, the hold of the church was weakened and the authority of the king severely shaken. And now that the population had halved to around two million, the poor began to realise they might have more opportunities in this bleak new world. There are definitely positive aspects to the Black Death as, as well as negative aspects because for a start there are many, many fewer people. There's more food to go around, there's better land to go around, there are higher wages, there are better clothes. There's evidence of more mobility uh, of population. People move about, they go to other villages, they go to towns, they enjoy the anonymity of the of the town rather than this rigid village life where there's a squire and a clergyman and a lot of peasants. The Black Death had tolled the bell for the end of feudalism. Those who survived it would have to rebuild their morale and their country, but at least the slate had been wiped clean. These were a new kind of Britain, people who were no longer happy just to kowtow to lord and bishop. An individualistic, and highly competitive era was about to begin. The series concludes with a double bill starting at 7 o'clock next Saturday. The book, Seven Ages of Britain, is available in the shops now, priced £20. To order a copy, call 0870 1234 344 or click onto channel4.com slash shop. Now, I make no apologies for pointing out that Ronnie Barker is definitely one of my heroes of comedy. His remarkable life and legacy, next. <laughs>